What happened in what Paris? Happened? Let them eat cake. I don't know if I should speak because I'm like, I'm hot about it. I just love wrestling. I love wrestling. You know what? I hope to remind them why I am the baddest bitch in the game. Welcome everyone to Ring Develop, this is DS, and today I was thinking about this moment since I was watching wrestling with my grandpappy, Mickey James is here! Thank you so much, how are you? I am good, I had to pull a little classic Mickey James look. I love it. I love it. The color, the half shoulder jacket. I know, wasn't that such a look? It was, it was a look and you had to own it. And you know, this is such a fortunate time for me to interview because you just came back to WWE, had your first match, which kind of blew up the internet. Have you seen the reaction from the fans? I have seen it, <laughs> the reaction. And I cannot be like, I love my fans. Thank you guys. <laughs> They're amazing. I'm like, Okay. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that later in the interview, but I think this is such a great time for us to look back on your legendary career. What better way than Ring the Bells Classic Top 5 Fan Voted Mickey James Moments. Are you ready to count down with us? I am. <laughs> All right. So let's start from the first moment. Mickey James! Oh, she might be a little low for you. Oh. Mickey James! WrestleMania 22, when you defeated Trish Stratus to become the women's champion. I love that. You know, that was one of those moments that I always, like, there's nothing like the first one. You know, it re really is. And I was so blessed to have such an amazing storyline, to have a chance to work with the top woman at that time. You know what I mean? And still is, like, you know, hands down, probably one of the greatest female champions of all time. And to be able to come in and align myself with her and to learn from her, and to really mold my character, it really set my, I think for the rest of my career, it set where I stood in the women's division. So yeah. I was so blessed. And then that moment, you know, you work so hard and so long for something and then it finally comes to fruition. It's like, it's magic. Something unexpected happened during the match when WrestleMania crowd turned on Trish Stratus. Yeah. They turned on Trish Stratus and started chanting for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Trish Stratus, who has done absolutely nothing wrong with these fans. And Trish Stratus able to kick out. That romantic oh, yes, relationship. How would you like to wake up to that, that smile every morning? What was that like? It was it was crazy. It was so crazy because it was not what we expected. But you know, WrestleMania crowds, they're so uh, polarizing anyway. <laughs> you know, they're, a, they're they're the best. There's nothing like performing in front of a WrestleMania crowd, right? Because people come from all over the world and are here for the whole show for every bit of it. I think it was just showed what really happens when when you really take the time to invest in a character like that. Um, and for the females, I can't think of a time that that it really had happened like that, where it was really like six months worth of build before yeah. we got to that moment where the people actually wanted to see me get my butt kicked, but then they were also kind of digging that little- Oh yeah. <laughs> drain side of me, you know? This is still to this day is one of the most loved storyline for the women, one of the best WrestleMania buildup. Like you said, it was over six months of buildup, like, and that's so rare. What do you think let it happen like that? You know, I don't know. I was just very blessed, you know? I think that it was something that the story, just the beginning story of me just coming in and it just kind of evolved. It evolved. I don't know if there was ever this plan to like, stretch it out that long and then to go all the way to WrestleMania with it. I don't really know. In my mind, you know, you hope for these things, but the character itself, I think that Trish and I were able to really work together with the writers and work with everyone to make this thing and really like layer it to where we didn't overload it right in the beginning. So then you were exhausted of seeing it by the time it got there. You know, it was like these little moments that we created, I think, that we all did together because it took the whole village to make it like that, you know? Yeah. The lesser known fact that I recently learned is that you almost debuted with CM Punk as a team. Do you guys ever talk about how it's like so fortunate that didn't happen? Yeah, he and I have definitely had that conversation a long time ago on a tour or something on the bus. Just how ironic it was because I would say that was probably before I left. And so he really hadn't even reached his peak. But at that oh. point, he was already getting, you know, super over in his own right but you think about how different our careers may have went 
<laughs> yeah. in our intro on Sunday Night Heat. Who's to say? So 12 years after you ran into Trish Stratus, again in the ring at Royal Rumble, and fans went crazy. They did. Oh, 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 here they are again. <laughs> Who will ever forget this rivalry? Trish and Mickey. Because you know, you hope for like those moments, you hope that people, that the fans are going to remember and that they're going to give you that same respect because you see it happen and you see it happen for the guys all the time and it's so great. And I still get, I get chill bumps on reactions like that. You know what I mean? And But then for it to come to happen for us, I think it was like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> That was cool. That was yeah. cool. It just was like, yeah, we did our part. After winning the title from Trish, you also won title from Lita in a retirement match. And a lot of people thought that was kind of Trish and Lita and WWE choosing you as the next person to hand it of that torch and run the next era of women's division. <laughs> I don't know if I was that person. I think there were some incredibly talented females at that time, you know, I was very fortunate to have those. And I had always really wanted to have a program with Lita. I had known her for so long and she was so, what a lot of people don't realize, she helped me out probably more than people even realized before I ever made it to television. You know, she would, I worked a lot of like indie promotions in the Carolinas and stuff. And she, ironically, she would, she was on television at the time, but she would be backstage because she was a fan of wrestling. She wanted to help, you know? So she would be backstage at these, like this one in particular, cause I don't think it was that far from then. It was like in Raleigh or whatever. And she would pull me aside and, and tell me like, Hey, maybe you don't do this anymore. And this, this do this, but maybe go into it this way or what, just like little things, little things that in that moment of like being, maybe two years into wrestling and really starting to go outside that bubble of wrestling school and work the indies and stuff. She was probably the first female to really do that for me. And she didn't have to, she didn't have to, you know what I mean? Yeah. And she's always been super cool, but she always stayed like that. Even like, from there, from being in OVW or just like climbing up the ranks, from finally getting a job in OVW to getting caught up on TV. Like she was so instrumental and so she was a leader, you know? She really, really was a leader and she doesn't get the credit she deserves in that respect, I think sometimes, so. Let's move to our second moment. And it is in 2008, in a UK tour, you defeated Beth Phoenix the Glamazon, Ding Dong the Witch's Dad, and you became the women's champion. <laughs> And recently, even Beth talked about how this is one of her favorite moments in her career. Like I get goosebumps even thinking about it. All the people stand up and like Mickey's reaction, it was like probably the most real moment I had felt in wrestling up until that point. That was one of my favorite rivalries of my career. That whole rivalry and that moment was so special. It was, I don't know if it was the very first time, but I know it was, I feel like it was the first televised time the women's championship had ever changed hands overseas. Oh, wow. We made the cover of the DVD that was released out there. I actually have it and I have it, <laughs> but we made the cover, but it was such a special moment because Beth had the opportunity to come in and really, she was unstoppable yeah. and it was the Glamazon and it was so amazing. And I think the way that they built her and her being like that, you know, undefeatable Glamazon and just this beautiful, powerful, strong female, it was amazing. And so to be able to finally defeat her after her being undefeated for so long out of nowhere and the title to change hands that quickly overseas, which I just think that no one expected it. It was such a special moment for me because I was the one to beat her, you know, and it was just, it was great. It was so, so great. One of my favorite matches with her, and I always say this, and she's mm -hmm. probably tired of hearing it, <laughs> is a match that we had in Alaska. It was like Fairbanks, Alaska, and it was a house show match. Oh. And we got a standing ovation from everyone, wow. everyone in the locker room when we came back. Wow. And it was that special. And she's just, she is so good, you know, strong and powerful, but yet so smart and giving. And you get a few people that you really have genuine chemistry with that uh -huh. you just, just dance so well with out there and tell those stories. And I always loved telling that story of the underdog and getting my butt kicked and getting my butt kicked and getting my butt kicked and then getting it out of note. Like, I just love that story. And it was just the perfect, perfect story. Yeah. 
You know, what's really special about this too is that, you know, you are obviously loved as a psycho heel character. And when charismatic heels sometimes turn baby face, they get a little vanilla, they lose that connection with the fans. But that obviously didn't happen with you. This moment, the emotion was there. But also, uh, you defeated a lot of the traditional model type women when it comes to all the popular votes, all the contests. Mickey! Mickey! so popular what do you think was like the ingredient of being popular baby face it's i always say being a baby face is one of the hardest things because yeah. especially today because people genuinely don't want to like people <laughs> Yeah, you know, you're right. We're always hating on something. So to be able to get people to genuinely care and love you, uh, it's a hard feat already. And when I came in and that story coming in, it ha- it was very instrumental on my level of baby face. So I don't really know. I think it's the stories that I had, you know, the stories that I had to have people genuinely care. Like, that's just it. It's like, it's not always like... For me, it wasn't always about the the moves. It was about the emotion mm-hmm. and getting people to genuinely feel and care about you. And that will determine whether they genuinely love you or hate you, you know? You know, speaking of Europe and the championship win, there was a mysterious show in Paris <laughs> when you won the title from Molina and lost it the same day. What happened in what Paris? What happened? Oh, what happened in Paris? We'll always have to <laughs> know if I should speak because I'm like there was three parts four parts of this match you know including the referee five if we could get the steamboat I'm just like so it was obviously a triple threat match and Melina was the champion and um Lisa was out there I made the cover and you know the three count happened <laughs> And, uh, you know, I became champion. It was like the mis- the championship not heard around the world. Yeah. <laughs> it's in the history books, though. So it that's is important. in the history books because I demanded it to be in the history books. <laughs> no, it really happened. It, it did, really it did. happened. And it was like the shortest um, championship title yep. ring for a very long time. Historical. Now there's a 24-7 championship, so I can't even have that anymore. <laughs> Let's move to the third moment. And it, it is... Look at me. I said, look at me. This is what a real women look wow. like. It is the Picky James segment. Look at me. I said, look at me. This is what a real woman looks like. There's a full dosage of manners being stopped. Let them eat cake. Ah, uh, yeah. I think that was a really empowering moment. You know, you take stories that I think that the people were really like, there was levels of both sides, whether they loved the storyline or they hated the storyline. And and having to be in that storyline and play that character, I'm a professional, I do my job, you know, but I felt like all I could do really do is take it and make it gold. That's all you can do in those situations. And I think that I had an opportunity to really grab onto those people who were in those positions of really feeling that, you know, feeling empathy for those people, because we've all been picked on. We've all been bullied. We've all been had these moments where we felt down about ourselves based on someone else's opinion of you and not of your own love for yourself. Right. So I think that it was a way to really help empower a whole new generation, you know, to be like, it doesn't matter what anyone thinks or says about you it only matters what you think and what you say for how controversial the storyline was so many girls and boys growing up said this really touched them because this generation everyone's constantly bullied in real life and online what does that mean personally to you to go through this storyline you know it was hard in the moments and i think it was hard for everyone like in order to do it there would be times where it's like oh i think this might be a little too far or like oh but i will say the end goal was to get Michelle and Layla over as monster heels and, and, and as the big heels out of the group. And I think it was very successful in that retrospect. And I think that for a generation of people, especially now with like speaking out and anti-bullying and all of these things, it's given people the power of, of their voice because words are so powerful. And I think that, oh my gosh, that's my dog. I think it just gave everyone like that power to be 
you know, okay with themselves and okay with using their voice and just mm-hmm. on what they believe in and what they believe is their truth. So, you know what I mean? So, and that's a powerful thing. So a lot of people are scared to do that, you know, of what either what everyone else will think or how people will judge them or, you know, the, the gamut, especially because cyberbullying and all that stuff yeah. is the thing these days, you know, so. After covering this important topic of, you know, women and the body image issue, in 2017 with the feud with Alexa Bliss, you tackled another important issue, which is what... <laughs> What society think of as the prime age for women? You know, that was the center of the storyline. Do you think that is improving in the pro wrestling industry? I think it is improving when you think of like, you know, some of the top, even the top females that are being pushed right now, you know, Shayna Baszler and Asuka, myself, Natty, to me, like there's, there's several women that are in their, you know, latter thirties, early forties, where as I guess, I don't know, I guess the average age prior to that would be you know, in their 20s, 24 or so. I think what the irony is, is that if you look at the average age of the male roster, oh yeah, much older, and that are champions and championship runs and all that stuff. But I think that's always been the stigma with women, you know, with the women's division and with women's wrestling. I think that it was always a stigmatism for them to be viewed as younger and in their 20s and the hot yeah. kicks and stuff. So it's taken a while to come up out of that, even though prior to that, we still had fabulous Mula and Sensational yeah. Jerry. And it's amazing because it has gotten better. It is getting better. You tell JLo that. You know what I mean? She's, yeah. she's, and she's fabulous and she's beautiful and she's still kicking down doors on a daily basis, you know? Mm-hmm. So. so let's move to the top four moment. And it is the steel cage match with Tara when you jump off the cage. These two have been going at oh, 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 look at this. Oh my God. This is dangerous. This is good. Oh my God. I would agree with you. Oh my God. So this match, you jump off the steel cage. Would you do that again? I would so do that again. <laughs> Especially if Lisa is standing there. Gosh, I could trust her with my life. Tara, also known as WWE's Victoria and Lisa Marie Verone, along with SoCal Val, you guys started a God TV. What's your favorite part of God TV? Oh my gosh, it's well, one, all the TV time I get, you know? <laughs> But seriously, no, it's so fun. It's so fun to kick back with my girlfriends, to have our friends on and to lift each other up and to support what they're doing inside, outside of wrestling, outside of the world of just like in acting. Like we're going to have Kato Kalen on this week's episode. We have some awesome guests lined up, but it's just fun. It's fun and it's lighthearted. And I think that we're so serious and so business and super wrestling, wrestling all the time that it's nice to give our fans, maybe our opinions on stuff. We talk about wrestling. We talk about some of that stuff, but a lot of it is stuff completely outside of that, just real life stuff or funny stories that happened or that we're talking about. And it's just like, it's interesting, you know, for me and it's fun and it's different. It's dynamic. And I feel like everybody's doing like, oh, these YouTube shows of, oh, this is me doing this around the house, which is cool. But I'm like, the amount of work that it takes, like just to put the show together, I can't, I mean, I'm sure you know, as doing like this podcast and everything is like, it's a fair amount of work, but fair amount of fun work, you yeah. know, because we get, and we get to really get the honest feedback because we go in live on the chats on Wednesday was when we're doing the show. So we get to see our chit chat with the fans and get their immediate feedback on the episode. And so it's evolving and we're still very new and, uh, but we're growing and I love it. Uh, let's go to our last moment. And it is 2016. Mickey J! Off the rope, and there's a hip attack. Oh! Oh, what a mistake! Chicken wing in. Oh, she's got it. When you return to WWE to face Asuka at NXT TakeOver Toronto. So fun. So fun. And I honestly didn't know what to expect. And I knew, like, I had already watched a lot of Asuka's stuff, so I already knew how great she was. I was excited. I was so excited, but I was nervous as to what the WWE Universe was going to, how they were going to react. Were they going to react? Were they going to care? They did care. <laughs> they cared. It was amazing. And Asuka and I, I felt like we had an amazing match. It was for the WWE Universe to not see me for seven years Mm -hmm. and have that because they may not have watched the TNA product. They may, or they had seen hardcore country Mickey James, but I'm coming back WWE Mickey James. A lot of the people hadn't seen me, you know, and for them to react the way they did and to, to then, you know, react about the match after the fact, the way they did. 
it was awesome. Yeah. It was so great. It was. I'm so grateful. So I just learned from your previous interview that you were thinking retirement before this match at Takeover, and for you to come back to have this five star match, and to do another full time at WWE. Like, what rekindled your passion? Um, it wasn't that I wasn't still passionate about it. Um, I think that when I looked at it prior to having Donovan. I kind of explored going back to WWE and I really didn't have a lot of like there was it just didn't seem like there was a lot of interest at that time. Um, it was more of like interest to be in a trainer role or something like that. And so then I had Donovan and that was amazing. It changed my life. Then I went back to TNA more for just like a couple one-offs and stuff. And I realized that I was doing signings on the independents. I really didn't like even bother to reach back out to WWE because I was like, well, at this point, like if they were interested, they know I'm here. They know where I'm at. They still have my number. Um, it has changed. So, <laughs> but it was just one of those things where I had honestly in my mind, just accepted the fact like, you know what? I've had a hell of a career. Yep. I've done more in the business than a lot of people can say. And, and I can honestly feel and say that there's a lot of women who are stars today and are going to be stars tomorrow that I helped influence a lot. And I am very grateful for that and very grateful for, you know, all the work I've done. And so what else do I really have to prove besides it's just more, you know, of an ego thing of like, I love to be the best. Mm -hmm. I love to work. I love to be out there and I love just, you know, making that magic. And it's really, I, that's never died and it never will die that I just love wrestling. I love wrestling. I hate bad wrestling. <laughs> you know how somebody just got to have that, like, let it go and just like, give it up, give it to, just give it to whatever you believe in God, universe, whatever, give it to them and just move forward with your life. And that's kind of like what I've done. I just like accepted and been like, you know what? I had a hell of a run. I'm good. I don't really have anything left to prove in that sense. I'm just going to raise Donovan and I'll do appearances here and there, but I really don't want to retire on the Indies. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I, I didn't want that. So I was just like, I think I'm just going to not wrestle anymore unless there's a reason to do it. And boom, <laughs> boom. I was like, oh, thank you. Let's talk about your recent return. I just heard that this was your first surgery in 20 plus year of your career. What was different about coming back this time? Um, I think one, I've never had a surgery, you know, like for injury wise. And so to get that surgery and which I honestly, I was walking on my knee. I was like acting. I didn't even realize like to the severity that I torn my ACL. I thought it was going to be a much shorter injury than it was, but it was, it's been fine. I mean, it was great. I recovered. I've been kicking butt in the gym. I did all my physical therapy. I was on the road as a commentator while I'm doing my recovery, while yeah. I'm doing my physical therapy, like I'm doing all this. And I have a son, I have a five-year-old, which I'm momming so hard on the daily. So I was really busting my butt. But then obviously as I'm set to come back, as I'm set to get cleared, we have a pandemic on our hands. So then I'm like, everything happens for a reason though. Everything happens for a reason. And so the last four months while I've been waiting to be able to get the opportunity to go in and get that last bit of clearance or whatever, I just... I mean, I'm still working out, I'm still busting my butt and stuff, but I just honestly took the time with my son. I was just like, you know what? <laughs> He's supposed to start school this year and it's like, you know, it's the summer. It's Best fine. Time. It's yeah. meant to happen. It's going to happen. And then, yeah. So last night, I mean, you made your in-ring return against Natalia. It blew up internet because, you know, the match, it was interfered by Seth Rollins for the men's storyline. No entrance. A lot of the fans were very upset. And they were called the internet for all the wrong reasons. Yes. The storyline, like Natty is badass. Natty is awesome. And I know that she and I, like, I felt like we were going to have a great match. We're going to kick butt. I love Natty. This character with Lana, evil. It's Terrible. awesome. It's like, oh, you know, so I felt like there's some genuine magic um, to be made there and to have like tell a really, really great story. It's just unfortunate that nobody saw it, you know? It's bullshit. I'm hot about it. But I am grateful to be back. I'm yeah, grateful absolutely. to be back. And it's just unfortunate. But you know, what about this? What do you want to show the audience this run? You know what? I hope to remind them 
of who I am and why my name is Mickey James yes. and why I am the baddest bitch in the game. <laughs> Absolutely. Do I want to say it with my head bobbing? No, I, I think I hope to remind them why I feel like I am the measuring stick. Us going through this top five moment really showed what an amazing, what a legend you are. So I think this will be a reminder for everyone. You're so sweet, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Mickey, for counting down top five moment with us. What's the last thing you wanna tell your fans? I just wanna say, uh, I love them so much. I'm so grateful for them. They've always given me the love and the respect and always been behind me and always supported me and I'm so grateful for them. I'm so grateful because they're always loud and proud and I love it. I wouldn't <laughs> want it any other way. 